is a key solution to working with vulnerable groups. So therefore, we are calling for housing first programs which have proven successful in ta tackling long-term homelessness require both available housing and wraparound support services. There is a need for increased investment in these programs and a widened focus on specific groups including young people. Also, there needs to be a focus on how to obtain more suitable tenancies for housing first purposes. Our second rec recommendation is that there is an existing service model called SLEE, which essentially is community support for people who move back into the community from temporary accommodation. And SLEE type supports need to be tailored and extended and linked to tenancy sustainment services in a continuum within the community. Our final point are for those individuals who health, whose health has deteriorated to such a level that they require support and accommodation in lots of cases for the rest of their lives. There needs to be consideration given to the long-term care needs of homeless people with complex health issues. As those living in the long-term accommodation units continue to age, there needs to be consideration given to how to support them as their health diminishes. There requires to be an increase in such accommodation provision and an increase in the health provision provided for such units. There also requires to be a definitive pathway into the nursing home or palliative care for those whose health has seriously deteriorated. It's a major travesty that homeless individuals who have nursing home needs find it hugely difficult to access nursing home care. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carroll, Mr. Don. Um, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Barry. Uh, um, well, you can look at each other. It doesn't matter whichever order you prefer to go in. Uh, Ms. Mr. O'Connell, okay. please. I'll do Garmahaga also then Desh can talk to Slower Living You. Um, I appreciate the, the opportunity to come and talk to you today. Uh, I, today I'm representing the Cork Social Housing Forum. Uh, I work with Cork Simon Community as the Assistant Director. Um, the Cox Social Housing Forum comprises a membership of 19 organisations from the voluntary sector. Uh, we have also had people from the, the, the statutory sector looking for membership recently, and I think that's indicative of the, the challenges that people in mental health services uh, and so forth are faced with in terms of trying to get access to housing and to decant people from the uh, acute facilities and hospitals and so forth. Uh, we believe that access to housing is a basic human right as well as a human need. And I think the fact that there's quite a mix here in terms of the, the spectrum of uh, politicians before us here, I think because we do all agree that we're dealing with some of the, the most vulnerable people, the most vulnerable citizens in society who now find themselves in, in really difficult circumstances, you know, single people, uh, families, women and children, um, you know, there's, there's a huge motivation uh, to drive a process forward here that will come up with a strategy that will deal with all the needs and ensure that nobody is left behind. Um, my colleagues from Dublin have mentioned uh, c quite a lot of the, uh, the issues here. I'm not going to go through my full submission. But I will say that we are faced with a huge crisis. Um, and the human cost on the individuals, uh, the men, women and children who are the most vulnerable of our citizens, uh, is inestimable in, in many respects. And in many respects, I think as a society, we will end up dealing with this issue uh, and pay a price for this long into the future, uh, which is a huge imperative on, on us on now to find solutions uh, to problems that uh, basically have their roots uh, in the fact that there has been no social housing building programme for many, many years now, and we are paying a price for that every day. Um, coupled with that, we've had the economic collapse. Um, but I think when you look at it from the perspective of people who are providing both homeless services and attempting to provide move-on accommodation for people, uh, the, every single system is under huge pressure and some of them are actually busting at the seams. Um, certainly from the Cox Simon perspective, uh, we've had a nine-fold increase since 2011 in the number of people who have been rough sleeping. And that's from uh, 38 people who slept rough one night more in 2011 to 345 in 2015. That's, an, that's indicative of the change uh, that has come about in the intervening period. Um, the going forward, because I think this needs to be about solutions, 
we need to find immediate wins to deal with some of the, the, the issues that are here. And one of those, as has been outlined earlier, is to prevent people falling into the system as it is. So everything that can be done in terms of bank foreclosures or um, anybody who finds themselves unable to pay the rent, where the rent is, has now gone beyond people's ability to pay, uh, those issues need to be dealt with. No one should be allowed to become homeless simply because of the gap between their income and what is re requested from the landlords. That simply shouldn't happen. It is a false economy not to pay it in the short term. And we're pushing more people into services that already can't cope with what they're dealing with. So we need to get re a bit real about what we're, what we're doing here and how we do it. Uh, but the, when we deal with the issues here, we need to be dealing not just with the immediate, but we need to be sure whatever we deal in the immediate, that that deals with, uh, that that has a huge kind of positive um, contribution to the long-term uh, solutions that we need to find. And they do need to be sustainable. Uh, it's about building communities as much as it's about building houses. And I think one of the things that we need to do and in terms of any housing strategy going forward is that we avoid the mistakes of the past, and that should be a principle that underpins any housing strategy going forward. We can no longer depend on the market to provide. The solution to homelessness and, and housing is about looking at a range, a suite of different types of responses. The market has proven that it cannot provide, and we need to look at other solutions. So, so the idea that we can depend on the private market to, to, to solve these problems uh, has long passed, uh, passed its, its sell-by date. Um, in terms of some of the more short-term uh, responses, uh, for lower people, rental properties are, are just, you know, just out of the range of people who are on low incomes. Um, rents need to be capped. The important thing is to have, in a way, to have some independent and external um, objective criteria to link it to, for example, uh, the consumer price index. So at least people's incomes would match uh, what's expected in terms of what they would pay uh, in, in, the, in the rental market. And obviously, the most immediate thing that can be done is that rent caps need to rise to stem the flow into homelessness in the short term. We can do that. I think we need to do it. I don't think we have a choice. And doing nothing is not an option. Um, the most acute aspects of homelessness, which is rough sleeping, and those who are long-term homeless also need to be prioritised for housing. There's a really good reason for that. They disproportionately hold up beds in emergency accommodation right across the state. Moving them on will free up beds that will allow us at least to try and bring in those who are rough sleeping and present. Um, but it's not easily done because nobody, uh, we're, we're dealing with individuals, lots of them with very complex needs, and no two needs are the same in many respects, but there are commonalities. But there is the housing first approach, and that has been proven internationally, uh, pathways in New York, right across Europe, uh, in Finland and other uh, countries, to have a huge impact in terms of moving people who would previously have been thought of as hard, very hard to house. Uh, and it has had quite a success, and 80% and more in, in lots of countries. Uh, but it's not just about housing. It's about the supports that go to support those people with the complex issues around mental health, addictions, dual diagnosis, and so forth. Um, we need to be very focused in the fact that uh, it's not just about families, it's not just about single people, it's about both. We need to be sure nobody's left behind here. And I think that's really important. Um, the other quick fix uh, solutions that could be uh, at least deal with some of the issues is the voids in local authorities. There are voids and in some cases taking up to 12 months to turn a house around. There is something about that that needs to be looked at uh, and new targets need to be set for the turnover of these, these houses and the obstacles that people face around tearing out the insides of houses and replacing them, putting them back to what it is. These things need to be looked at. Practical response. So we need to be very practical in how we deal with this here. You know, we're talking about people's lives, so we need to look at what we can deliver for people, and we should always look for something that we would be satisfied to take for ourselves. <laughs> the, the other resources of the state and the local authority also need to be marshalled, and this includes NAMA. Now, NAMA's remit has primarily been to deliver uh, for the exchequer, 
Uh, but there's two ways you can deliver. You can deliver for the exchequer in monetary terms, uh, but you can also deliver a social dividend. And in our view, the social dividend has not been of the, to the extent that it should have been in terms of supporting the social housing provision uh, for the state. Uh, we will end up, may end up even, and if we have to, we, we need to do this, uh, where vulture funds are basically selling off the assets that they have bought from NAMA. Uh, if necessary, they should, the government needs to CPO those to block those people coming into homelessness. We've got to stem the flow there as well. But we've got to look at what NAMA can deliver. And, and I think there's much about NAMA that we don't know. Uh, and I think certainly there's more that it can do in terms of becoming part of the solution or more of the solution than it is at present. Um, there has been, in the last number of years, certainly since 2008, uh, a huge um, cutback in supports and resources to both the voluntary and the statutory services. Uh, lots of them, are, like I said, are actually struggling to, to cope. Um, capacity has been lost. Corporate memory has been lost in some of the, the local authority areas. Um, and the resulting deficits and the ca capacity that is there as a result of that, they need to be addressed because if we're going to deal with a housing building program, which is what we are advocating for, uh, then you need to have the people in place that, that, that can deliver that. Um, so those issues in terms of resources need to be dealt with. And we need to treat this as a crisis, the crisis that it is. It is a national crisis, uh, and it should be dealt with in that respect. There should be no shirking from using the mechanisms available to government and local authorities, such as compulsory purchase orders or party planning to speed up the delivery of housing. There are also other resources there that are within the gift of some of the local authorities. There are derelict sites. There, are ho there is housing that has not been used at the moment. Uh, and I'm, I'm led to believe, certainly, as I think this is the case in Cork, uh, that the local authorities know where they are and who they are. Uh, and I think that's something that would speed up delivery of social housing, and we should maximise the, the ability of the local authorities and the voluntary sector working in, 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 in consultation and in conjunction with each other to maximise the, the effective delivery as quickly as possible of any of the units that this might leverage. Um, but the key to solving this problem, and let's be clear about this, from a social housing perspective, social housing is the key to solving this problem into the long term. Whatever we do in the short term, we need to provide social housing. There is an imbalance in terms of what has been provided at the moment. In 2004, 10% of the provision was by private rent. It is now 20%. And the private rent sector is in difficulties even at the moment. So we need to deal with that end of it as well. But we also need to look at the provision from the local authorities uh, and the social housing providers, and we need to look at the resources that they have and use the resources that are actually there at the moment so that there are in -house there's in-house capacity to design and develop housing within the, the social housing providers. If it's not there in the local authorities, then we need to lean on that. Everybody needs to be part of the solution. Um, so in the long term, the state-sponsored housing building programme uh, needs to be led by the local authorities and supported in and in partnership with, and I think it's important to say that, it needs to be in partnership. Everybody needs to be working together here. This is a shared problem, and we have shared responsibilities in this respect. Um, in the immediate term as well, housing acquisition is a short-term solution, but the finances need to be provided to allow the local authorities to purchase uh, units that are available and ready for immediate occupancy. That is one of the key things that they can do as well in the short term. Um, I would have to say that the problem is huge, but it is not insurmountable. It is not beyond the capacity and the talents and the commitment and the motivations uh, of people in this room and the services that are out there, be they statutory or voluntary. We just need a will to do it. And we need to prioritise it as an issue in terms of resource provision uh, for this. Cooperation is going to be one of the key things here. Cross-departmental and interagency buy-in is critical. In some cases, the system is working against each other. We're working against each other in many different ways. We may actually make it very difficult in terms of HAP and all the other things that we do. We need to simplify what we do and make it easy for people to navigate the system to know about HAP, what it is, and so forth. You know, we really need to, to get the grips by making it simple. We're making it hard for each other, and nobody has either the time 
are the uh, are the resources to be wasting time and stuff that could be easily uh, dealt with? And I've mentioned some of them are mentioned in the, in the in the greater um, uh, submission. But it has to be led by somebody, and that somebody should be the Minister for Housing. And what is done should be planned with clear objectives, specific targets, and time frames for delivery. And teams must be tasked to deliver, and they need to be decision makers with authority that can will overcome the inevitable challenges that will emerge from lots of different sectors and lots of different uh, positions. Um, and they must deliver housing as quickly as possible. And I think we can do that, but we need to do it and meet the requisite standards and do it in a transparent and accountable way, because we should all be accountable. It is public money. It belongs to the people, and it should be spent, for the, particularly for those the most vulnerable of our citizens. Um, and we need that can-do attitude. We really have to get to grips with that. We need to know that we can solve the problem. It is huge. It is very, very difficult. But it can be done. Families and single people are in crisis, and they're dependent on us to deliver for them. You know, that is a huge responsibility. It is a shared responsibility. It is all of our responsibilities. And I think we really need to get to grips and be very practical in what we do and how we do it. And no stone should be left unturned in terms of this delivery. The time for action is now, and we should not leave anybody behind. Thank you, Mr. O'Connell. Uh, Ms. O'Connor, yeah. and finally. Hi, my name is Trina O'Connor and I'm currently the project leader with Focus Ireland in Limerick and we cover Limerick, Clare and Arthur but I'm here today in my capacity as the chairperson of the Limerick Homeless Alliance and the Clare Homeless Alliance. Both of them are separate alliances and they meet separately in Limerick and Clare um, and I happen to have the job of chairing both. Um, so the Limerick and Clare Homeless Alliance welcomed the establishment of the Oireachtas Committee on Housing and Homelessness and its short, <coughs> focused approach to identifying solutions to a crisis that is impacting on so many families and individuals. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, homelessness is a complex problem with both economic and social causes. It is frequently about much more than a housing problem, but it always includes a housing problem. Every exit from homelessness requires a house. Other supports are often needed, but housing is paramount. This submission takes its lead from the committee's agenda and therefore concentrates on housing and it is important to note that in order for homelessness to be effectively tackled, a broad range of measures are also needed. Just as there is recognition that the current crisis results from a lack of investment in housing, it also needs to be recognised that the lack of investment in social infrastructure such as mental health, social work and such also must be in reverse so that we are if we are to truly solve the problem. Addressing homelessness requires a sustained commitment, strong principles and a clear vision of what is needed by families, communities and the society. In its short lifespan, this committee cannot solve the full range of problems, but we do hope that it can help to establish such principles across the political spectrum in order to sustain longer term policy making. The submission concentrates on measures that can and must be initiated immediately, but it's in some cases their impact will be immediate and in others they will take time to come into effect. Um, members of the Alliance in both Clare and, and Limerick are made up in Clare. The Homeless Alliance is made up of all voluntary organisations. So there's about 12 different organisations that are involved in providing services in the Limerick, and Limerick City and County region. And in Clare, it's made up of 14 organisations which are statutory and voluntary. And some of the, the um, barriers and solutions that we felt that were relevant to name today, and they, I do, we go into much more detail in the submission, um, just to say that all the organisations that are around the table and the alliances are there to prevent single people and families from becoming homeless, but also to support exits from homelessness as well. Um, we would see the barriers pretty much the same as my colleagues have said as well, um, just around the lack, the supply really, so the lack of housing and the lack of affordable housing is definitely a major um, barrier for the, cost, the, the people that we work with in, in, in the Midwest region. Also the rapidly rising rents and over-reliance on the private rented market is also another one. Um, insufficient rent supplement levels and also we feel that the HAP uh, payments need to be reviewed. There's a serious lack of one bedroom accommodation in nationwide in the country. So on the 26th of April of this year, there were five one bed units available in Limerick City. Um, the rent for those were between 500 and 650 and the rent cap was 375. So, 
Um, insufficient capital funding results in fewer AHBs, approved housing bodies, providing housing units also. There is a disproportionate burden of financial risk on the AHB, so that disincentivises AHBs from developing social housing units as well, depending on their size. Um, we also feel that a barrier is the reduced social welfare payments to under 25s, um, and that there is a huge increase in youth homelessness at the moment. Um, currently, from the current stats, over 50% of people accessing hostel accommodation in Limerick and Clare are 30 years of age and under. That's a frightening statistic, I think. Um, some of the solutions that we felt that were relevant, and I'm just there's only a few of them I'm going to name, and some of them we went into more detail. So, uh, a wide-scale, long-term social housing building programme, which my colleagues have said as well, is the key, um, and a partnership approach between the state and the AHBs is paramount. Uh, we felt that the front front-loading accelerated CAF, which is the Capital Advanced Leasing Facility payments, to enhance an approved housing body's ability to provide social housing by freeing up cash flow. Um, we felt that there needed to be an extension of the homeless HAP outside of Dublin and Cork. It's not anywhere else, and that it's definitely needed in, in the Midwest region. We felt that there needed to be an increase in rent supplement as a preventative measure um, to keep families and individuals in their home. Um, and as I said, the stat around the one, the one beds is, is relevant in that, that example as well. We felt that there's a need to recognise prevention in the Housing Act 1998 in Section 10, and that's to amend it and to reflect that people can be resourced then to adequately provide um, preventative strategies. Um, implementation of rent regulation linked to the Consumer Price Index. I think that was mentioned already as well. Um, speedier turnaround of vacant social housing units. Um, as already been stated, it can take up to 12 months for a housing unit to become available again. Um, in probably in the biggest housing crisis that we've had, it, it's, it's not acceptable. Uh, more social housing available regarding first housing first and housing-led projects are needed throughout the country. Um, there needed to, we need to revert the reduced um, social welfare payment for under 26s who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. We need to recognise the right to a home in the constitution. We also need to recognise the increase in youth homelessness as a very real issue that's taken place in, nationwide. And finally, we felt that better land management by government to prevent hoarding by NAMA and developers in areas where housing is most required, and including that this should be a national register of sites. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, to, to all of you for the opening statements and presentations, thank you very much. Just before I go to um, take the questions, uh, because we have three distinct groups of witnesses here, to colleagues who are asking questions, uh, if you have a specific question you're directing to somebody, uh, please state it at the outset. And then to the witnesses, um, to avoid repetition, but feel free uh, when the questions have been asked if you want to comment on it. And I suppose one particular thing struck me, and it was yourself, Mr O'Connell, said, you know, we're here to look for solutions and that. And that's the remit of the committee. So if there's something on your mind and something, you know, in terms of be as direct and as forward as, as you like to be, um, you know, that is our function. Rather than having a history lesson, we're trying to come forward with real practical solutions. And, you know, you, you've all made recommendations. We have the written recommendations by all means, but please feel free to add to those during the course of the afternoon. Deputy O'Brien, you're first. Uh, Chair, and uh, just to start, I suppose to commend both your own organisations and, and the other organisations that your networks represent. Um, uh, we see today that the official Department of Environment homeless figures are at their highest point ever, uh, 6,000 uh, people, almost 2,000 children. And just to put that in context, Chair, the official figures from the Department of Environment in 2008 were 1,394 people officially homeless. Now, I know lots of us disputed those, but if the official figures have showed a quadrupling at a time when the budgets of year organisations, as well as local authorities in the department, have been reduced, it just shows the, the scale of the challenge that you're working with on a daily basis. Uh, some of my questions are specific and some of them are general. I think people will, will be able to work out which are which. I, I just want to start with Brew Imshire. Um, Brew Imshire, as people know, is a 100-bed uh, emergency hostel here in the city. Um, and uh, Fiona, you said that uh, there were 58 beds available last night, uh, and we know that there was about 90 people who were turned away from uh, the free phone service to access those beds. But what you didn't say, and I just want you to confirm for the committee, that uh, our understanding is that that hostel is essentially to be progressively closed by the end of this month. So as those people uh, have move-on accommodation or permanent accommodation, they won't be replaced by other people coming into homelessness, which means the City of Dublin will lose 102 beds or 100 beds by the end of this month. 
Can you just also confirm that that's a facility that's ultimately owned by the state, that while it's digital hubs premises, it's the Department of Communications who are ultimately responsible, and therefore we're facing a situation at a time when we had 90 people potentially on the streets last night, if not 100 people uh, on the basis of the last count, that we're about to close 100 beds, and it's the state that is facilitating this, because I just think if, if anything else we're going to do in this committee today, we need to send a clear signal to the Minister for Communications to pick up the phone to Digital Hub and say, not only should that hostel not close, but those beds should not be removed from the system. So I just would like a, a comment on that. On rent supplement, I share the desire to see it increased, but I have a big concern. Programme for Government says that there will be an increase in rent supplement and half payments. It doesn't say there will be rent certainty or linking rents to the consumer price index. And my fear is just increasing rent supplements and half on their own will actually have an upward pressure on rents. And both for people reliant on rent supplement or low income families who aren't eligible for rent supplement in counties where there's no HAP, that could actually make the situation worse. So i just like your view on rent certainty and how important it is as a complementary measure to, to uh, 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 rent supplement increases. Length of time in emergency accommodation, if any of you can give the committee indications of the average length of time uh, of people in emergency accommodation that you're currently experiencing in your different parts of the country, I think that would be useful. <clears throat> and also, there's obviously this debate around those people who become homeless because of the more traditional triggers that Declan mentioned, and those people, and particularly families, who are becoming homeless purely as a result of, result of the other aspects of the housing crisis. If you can reflect on that a little bit, and is that actually kind of disadvantaging those people who are homeless because of the traditional triggers, because they're being even further pushed to one side as the public focuses on the families with children, etc., and what we need to do about that. Homeless budget, 70 million. The programme for government commits to that level of spend. Can you give us some indication of what you think the real spend is required just to meet the emergency accommodation needs? And linked to that, you said return the HSE fund to 2010 levels. What are we talking about money-wise? Emergency accommodation, could you just talk a little bit about the difficulties of appropriate emergency accommodation for families with children and people with special needs? Because obviously a lot of the emergency accommodation is pre-2008 and it was more the kind of low threshold hostels. I just think it would be valuable for us to hear uh, some of that. Um, and the last two questions. David, I take your point around the allocation schemes and, and people who don't have a home having priority. I suppose the only difficulty is, is that from a good estate management point of view, if you prioritise those people that have the greatest needs, particularly needs beyond their housing needs, particularly, for example, mental health needs or addiction needs, etc., that creates a difficulty from a local authority's point of view in terms of good and, and sustainable community estate management. And I just, I'd like a, your kind of thoughts on that as how you marry those two things. And the last, we've had a couple of conversations here in previous committees about the rural urban issues uh, and obviously most of you are working in urban areas and just those that aren't the committee would like to hear more about the specific challenges facing uh, families at risk of homelessness and in emergency accommodation in rural parts of of the, the state uh, as part of our considerations thanks chair thank you deputy right there's a range of questions there so uh, i don't know who wants to to start is, yeah the easiest in relation to brew i'm sure i might be able to assist them with some of the other answers as well. Um, so, Brew I'm sure opened as a cold weather facility for a very definite time period and it was due to end at the end of March. That would usually be the case in terms of cold weather facilities. I suppose it brings back to that point around whether or not accommodation for a night is a human right all year round or whether or not it's a human right just for a few months in the winter. I want to say on the record, the Digital Hub Development Agency and the businesses within the Digital Hub have been phenomenally supportive of the service from day one. And I am aware that in some media they seem to receive some negative attention. They have been phenomenally supportive at every point along the way. In terms of the facility, um, we have, since the facility opened in November, we've actually moved nearly 200 individual people through the facility who would have been on one night only, so would have been sleeping rough or would have been in that system of one night only systems. Nearly 200 individuals have been moved through into a more secure, stable accommodation. So they've moved through the rough sleeping, through that chaotic period, and are now in one of the longer-term placements, whether it's supported temporary accommodation, 
uh, temporary emergency accommodation or into tenancies of their own. So in terms of the throughput, it's been quite phenomenal. So you're right in saying that whilst we have now 43 people on site, we would be expecting to, that we would be as successful in moving those through and those beds one by one would be closed. However, that is the end of the lease. So we went in and did what we were asked to do in terms of on contract and we moved as many people through as possible. The digital hub have done what they were asked to do and provide this unit. However, we're in a situation where the magical housing that was supposed to be provided isn't there. The private rented sector isn't accessible to people who are in homeless services. And there is many blocks in terms of those individuals trying to access local authority housing, which doesn't exist anyway. So, as we've pointed out, the prevention issue of the flood of people coming into homeless services is so dramatic that until we started the orderly wind down of those beds, we remained consistently at the capacity of 101. But because we didn't want to just reach a point, we did agree that we would, as we moved people through, we would start reducing those beds. So, as we moved one person into a longer term placement, we would close that bed rather than closing the door on the 25th or 26th of March to 101 people and leaving them completely out. However, in terms of the placement this week, the central placement service wasn't able to continue placing people on a one-night-only system, so we took in the people that were on those longer term, the rolling placements, as we say, who we would be working with to try and move them out, and those 43 remain in the unit at the moment. I suppose from a personal level, um, it is difficult for cross-care and for the cross-care staff team to be in a building where there is empty beds. and um, and. You know, that, that's a real difficulty, particularly when we hear that there's then people being left out and receiving sleeping bags rather than accessing beds. So in terms of that facility, my understanding is it is a state-owned building. It is under the Department of Communications. And my understanding is that it probably needs to be the Minister for Housing with the Minister for Communications reaching some form of agreement for that facility to continue. It's not what we want. It is a converted warehouse, but it is of a very high standard for those of you who have seen it. And I think what happened yesterday when people came in and stayed, what they were saying to us is they felt safe. This was somewhere that they wanted to be. And so, you know, that compared to... Uh, sleeping rough. It is a very high quality facility and uh, so I suppose that in answer to your question is what needs to happen. However, Brew is only a tiny little tip of that iceberg. What we need is increased emergency accommodation while we're resourcing prevention, while we're resourcing a housing scheme. But, but until those two pieces happen, we're going to have to invest in additional emergency accommodation for singles, couples and families because otherwise we're just going to keep seeing spiralling numbers of rough sleepers coming into the system. So it needs to be emergency facilities provided and adequately resourced. Mr John. So um, just in response to that question about Brew, um, it has been stated earlier and there is no doubt that we're all committed to independent living and we want to move away from emergency. But I'll make just a couple of very short, succinct statements on this. So the rough sleepers count in Dublin, the most recent one says 102 people rough sleeping. Um, in addition to that, there are close to 70 people in Merchants Quay in the cafe overnight. And there has also been 101 people in the brew facility. So the effect of the closure of this 101 facility will double the number of rough sleeping overnight. And I don't believe any of us wish to see that happen. We have a good service provider, we have a funder. Really, we just need the availability of this building to be continued for a period until such time as another facility can be found. 
Thank you. The other questions, and I think you're happy with that answer. Yeah, sure, but thank you very much. There was a range of other questions, and the committee are happy with the response, and I think understand the issue quite fully. The other issues that uh, Deputy O'Brien uh, raised. Um, I suppose I'll take the rent increases and, and that. Um, I suppose just to explain why we would like to see the rent increase, the rent caps increased across the board. Just as an example, there's 70,000, I think, across the country that are currently claiming rent supplement cases. I know it's been mentioned that if you increase rent supplement, that um, these 70,000 cases of rents will increase. That's not the case. The legislation was changed there last year in relation to how, many, how often landlords can increase the rent. So that's changed to the 24 months. So that curtails a lot of people. But also just to explain, there's 20,000 people in Dublin on rent supplement through the TPS who have the ability to get people rent caps above the, the current um, rent limits. 1,914 of those cases have been, have been taken up through the TPS. So just by raising rent caps across the board doesn't automatically mean that everyone is going to get a rent increase. It's just that it's available to them should they need it. Um, I suppose rent regulation and rent certainty just it, it stops rent spiralling out of control which again they are continuing to do um, and it gives people a security of tenure then as well so that they, could, they can remain in that tenancy. Okay. Uh, Deputy, maybe I'll take the, the length of time in emergency accommodation and the allocations issue. Um, latest figures um, indicate that 1,290 people in, in, currently in temporary accommodation have been there for over six months, um, which indicates the difficulties in actually moving people on. And what we have found has been that the introduction of HAP has been particularly significant in our ability to, from an affordability point of view, to move people on. However, obviously the availability of suitable housing has been the issue. Um, so, uh, so uh, you know, as a network, we're absolutely committed to getting people out of temporary accommodation as soon as possible. On the allocations issue, um, I think the current situation is that I think there's a recognition that um, some of the individuals and households that we do work with um, require support in order to return to the community. But currently, there is not equitable access to social housing stock within the community. We happen to Paul uh, work in Northern Ireland as well, where there is a common selection scheme by which each individual household who's on the waiting list is allocated um, a, a points system um, by, and, and that, that um, accesses them from a priority perspective, um, but also as well determines the level of support that these households require in order to return back into the community. I think when we're looking at the whole allocations approach that um, such selection schemes should be considered. But also as well, we talked um, a lot earlier on around Housing First. Um, Housing First is uh, an internationally recognised um, a model by which individuals with complex needs are supported within, within, within their communities. It operates here through Focus Ireland and Peter McVeary Trust uh, very successfully. In Belfast, uh, we operate a housing first system where we've, worked, we've moved 64 people in the last two years of the, of the highest needs back into communities again. Uh, but what that requires is the availability of uh, appropriate accommodation uh, that is affordable, but also a, also a suite of wraparound supports that have to be funded and coordinated and case managed in order for those individuals to survive within community settings as well. Thank you very much. Okay. Deputy Durkin. Thank you, Mr Chairman, and I thank our guests for uh, coming before the committee <coughs> and for giving us that, that information. Uh, clearly, they have a, a, an intimate knowledge of the subject, and this course comes from working directly with the, with, with the subject matter concerned. And I compliment them uh, on their, their obvious uh, knowledge in the area. Uh, as you know, Mr Chairman, we, most of us have been members of local authorities, and in actual fact, we have... Uh, John Ryan. Absolutely certain. Maybe that. That's 
that's not the phone now. That's, that's not, that's not, it doesn't receive calls. It's, However, o- it's okay, uh, What I wanted to say, I've, what I wanted to say I've is this. For the new Those of us who are public representatives as well uh, do and should have as equally intimate a knowledge of the subject, and I'm glad to say I think that we all, without exception, do have that knowledge. I think you're absolutely right in identifying the problem, the lack of social housing, and some of us strongly objected to the policy change that came about many years ago, about 16 years ago, uh, which would come home to roost eventually where we are now. And it is no harm to repeat that, Chairman. Because, as I said to you a week ago, we can talk forever about the subject unless we get back to the direct build and have the responsibility for local authority housing. And we're social housing, I'm not so sure that I agree with it, I never did agree with it. Uh, t- back to the local authorities. And that's the only way it can be resolved. The points raised uh, in relation to people with, 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 with particular difficulties, vulnerable families, uh, perhaps special needs, perhaps addiction, and so on. I think they're better served by a body or bodies that have specific uh, 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 skills in that area, and the local authorities don't have that. And I, I would be the very, I've always said that, but there's a huge difference in the, the two requirements. In the middle of the boom, Chairman, there were people homeless, sadly. Sadly, in, in, in this city and around this country, all of us had to deal with it from time to time. <clears throat> and the system wasn't able to deal with it then. That's the problem. If it wasn't able to deal with it in the middle of the boom, how could it possibly it, b- 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 pretend to deal with it in the aftermath? So the, the question that now arises is this. When do we get to a situation, I'm not posing this is to ourselves, Jeff. That's all right. This is to ourselves. When do we get to a situation to, to, to remove the necessity for emergency housing insofar as it's possible? There will always be a minimal amount of requirement there, but generally to remove it. Because what we're doing now is we're housing people in emergency housing, and that shouldn't be the case. So we, we, we have to get away from that. It's a little bit like, like waiting lists. When the person is on a waiting list, and they're on a housing emergency waiting list as well. And eventually you get the situation where to get on the emergency waiting list, you have to go on another waiting list, and that's, that is totally unacceptable. And it, it's un- unfortunately, it's un- unfortunately one of the, uh, one, one of the, the, the legacies of, of some of the things that I talked about already. I would, I would particularly compliment uh, um, the Simon community for identifying uh, you know, the refitting of, of houses that have been handed back. That's typical all over the country. Some local authorities are beginning to discontinue the situation whereby the kitchens were ripped out of perfectly good houses, tossed out of the skip, and replaced with what was originally put into that particular local authority house. Now, if you were to explain this to somebody outside of the, the group that we have here, People cannot understand how that happens. But it happened all the time. The purpose of the exercise allegedly was so that the local authority wouldn't have to uh, uh, replace a teak or oak uh, kitchen or whatever the case may be. The logic of it just escapes me, Chairman. But it is now causing a, a large amount of the problem. Can I, can I uh, venture for a moment into an area that wasn't covered? And that is the housing, uh, sorry, the shared ownership loans. The rental equity of which is a massive burden on the unfortunate people, particularly in the last 10 years, because a change took place uh, whereby 4.7% of, of, of an increase was placed on the rental part of the equity annually, which is an absolute disgrace and makes it impossible for those people. It was a penalty. Can I interrupt you for a moment, yeah. please? Yeah. Um, we have four, three networks in, and some of the points you're making are very relevant to us in our deliberations, both in terms of formulating a report and recommendations. But I'm particularly anxious for the witnesses we have here that if there are specific questions to address to them, in other words, that we elicit the information in public session with our witnesses and we formulate and have our internal debate based on the information that we receive. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm making a general comment. I'm asking you to applies, ask them a question. Applies, that, that, applies to, that, applies to, that applies to all of them. Absolutely. I, I suggest that we bring, Duff, we bring uh, Deputy Durkin in here for submissions on that. Well, if Deputy Wallace feels that, I would be quite happy to do that too. Deputy Durkin. Deputy Durkin. I, I can, uh, can I just continue, Sean? No, but I'd like you to direct questions. Uh, well, I know, but I am. Um, yeah. 
Uh, look, uh, I, I'll tell you, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. We, I, 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 I have a fairly good idea what the answers to the questions are, and I think the people who are here today with us have already presented to us what are effectively the, 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 answer, the question and the answer. So it's up to us to, to deal with it after that, after that. The support for the vulnerable is a point that was raised by, by numerous people. And that's something that is growing. Uh, and, and the problem is this, that people who previously had difficulty getting a local authority house now find themselves homeless and are on a different list altogether and with, with growing numbers. So it comes back again to the need to reinvigorate the direct build of the local authorities and call them local authority houses. And alongside of that, the reintroduction of the local authority loans has to, has to be introduced in order to pick off the people who, previously, who are now coming down on top of the local authority housing list, who previously were able to, to, to provide themselves with the house, and they're the people who, who are young people. Last point I want to make is in relation to um, um, the people that, that, that uh, all three groups have, have referred to. We find in, 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 in our work as public representatives that the people we deal with are young people. They're all young people, more of, mostly with families. And it is a sad reflection on our society that we have children whose first introduction to life is that they don't know where they're going to live tomorrow, or that they do know where they're going to live tomorrow, and it is an emergency accommodation. And that's a sad reflection on all of us. And, I'm, I, I, and I say this goes back again to bef even before the boom, when it was obvious that these things were going to happen. And the, 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 the point I want to make there and emphasise is this. It is essential now, just the same as in preparation for schools, the demography has to be taken into account, it is essential now that we identify the housing need in relation to the number of families coming on stream, the number of children born in a particular year, and the number of people likely to be in need of, of local authority housing or any other type of housing in the years, the 10 to 15 to 20 years afterwards. I'm sorry for going on, Chairman, but that's my, my take on what I have dealt with in the last 10 years. Thank you, Deputy. To the witnesses, I'm going to take another question, and you can feel free to comment on what Deputy Dirk and Deputy Ryan, you're next. Uh, uh, thanks, Chair. I'd like to thank the three groups for coming in and, and sharing their insights with us and making uh, many recommendations. Um, Mr. Dunn opened in terms of indicating like, the, the, the supply issue. Uh, and certainly, in my view, what we have today is a crisis of supply, be it in private houses or social houses. And we have a housing strategy in place, a government housing strategy, the outgoing government housing strategy, which is going to deliver some houses in a year or so, uh, 18 months to two years. But what I would like to put to the three groups is, look, you know, you've talked about preventive measures as well, so we've got to prevent people going into homelessness. Uh, and they're the ones that are in homelessness that we have to try and address with, with housing solutions. But to the three groups, have you any ideas of how to fast track much needed supply? Uh, you know, because I mean, the long term stuff we're all agreed on, we need to change it, we can look back and say, you know, it wasn't done properly, we, have, we are where we are. But what we need from groups like yourselves is some ideas in terms of how can we fast track, how can you help us get, you know, fast track those kind of solutions. On the rent supplement issue, um, I don't share the views, and I hear lots of NGOs uh, kind of, one of the first things to say is we've got to increase rent supplements across the board. I don't share that view. And as a practitioner who uh, has clinics, eight clinics every week from Balbriggan to Swords and areas of, of housing crisis, what comes into me in my clinic is somebody who is about to be made homeless and is looking for a place to stay. And the problem is they can't find a place to stay or to rent. But I know, irrespective of the caps, that if they find a place, the community welfare officer has the flexibility to meet the, the requirement of the, uh, to go beyond the caps, and it has been happening, and is consistently happening. So that's what I see. Uh, I also see a situation where people who are in accommodation and the landlord wants to put it up, put up the rent, and I know that the community welfare officer will provide the flex, will have the flexibility to meet that increased demand. So, to the extent that where the need is there to for you know increased rent supplement, 
it is supplied. So why in the name of God would you increase the rent caps? for all of the other people within the 70,000 who, where there's no pressure to put it up. That wouldn't be a great use of resources, in my view. Uh, Mr Dunn. So I might address just one or two of those points and let others jump in. So in terms of um, fast-track supply, um, the two things that come to, to mind are acquisition and rapid building. So, so just to say, to absolutely agree that we're in a situation where we cannot have a thriving economy without a functioning housing market. And the overall housing market has all sorts of impacts, whether you're Google trying to, having to pay more rent to, to, more to your employees to rent accommodation in Dublin or, or whoever. And within that bigger bubble of the whole housing supply, uh, public housing or social housing is subset, and below that comes the, the homeless factor and with the private renter in between. But all are interlinked, and the move on between them is causing all sorts of difficulties and having us in a situation where we're continuing with emergency accommodation that none of us ever wanted to see in this day and age and still don't want to see. So in terms of the answer to the approach to uh, fast-track supply... Um, the nature of our system, our planning and our building system is that development, like many of our organisations are also approved housing bodies and are involved in building and, and the supply of, of housing units. And it is remarkable how long that takes, you know, from the initial identification of a site. It can be between two and a half and three years to actually deliver the supply. And it is no different, I think, for a local authority. So in terms of while we move all that forward and policies decisions are made here and the doll in relation to local authority housing, we have in the interim a need to, for urgent supply. And the two routes that appear to be available are acquisition, whether it's by local authority or by AHBs or, or by whoever. Um, and that is something that could move relatively quickly. The second one is in terms of rapid build housing. So when this was first mooted, you know, many people stopped and thought about whether this was a desirable thing or what was the quality of the housing going to be or, you know, what were we entering into? Were we were entering into a two-tier system of good quality housing and very uh, shoddy housing. Um, I'm happy to say that the, that the way things have, have, have moved on in that area seem to indicate that what we're now talking about is not poor quality housing, but faster built housing. Um, so my understanding is that the current um, tender that's been issued in the Dublin region um, is for housing that is guaranteed to last a minimum of 60 years. Um, and the quality of the housing supplied in um, the Papantry area in Ballymun appears to be a very high standard. Um, and I know that um, the Paul are involved in supporting that and my own organisation, Sophia, are, are involved in the support of an ex another scheme that's coming. I do believe that the targets that we're setting are way, way below the, the pressing need. And Minister Coveney highlighted the many millions that are being spent in, in, in hotels at the moment. So... I would be suggesting that we accelerate acquisition as an interim emergency measure and that we accelerate rapid build uh, both in its planning elements and also in its construction elements. Thank you. Would anybody like to address specifically also the, the second question? Um, so I wonder if I could yeah. just come in in terms of the rapid build programme. Um, just in our wider submission to you we do raise the issue of the tenure type because the schemes that are being built and under the Rapid Build programme at the moment are still being deemed to be emergency accommodation, whereas in reality with the quality of the build it would appear that a review of the tenure type might actually be in order at this point as well. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Ryan also raised the issue on the rent uh, rent allowance and the increase in it. Does anybody would anybody care to comment, Mr. O'Connell? Well, I suppose one one of the things I would say about that is that not everybody will be looking for the increase at the same time. Uh, so the idea that it could be everybody would not be tr true to say uh, in, in terms of a simultaneous uh, spend. Um, but what it would do in the short term is hold people where they are. And I think that's the important thing. The other thing as well is that the expertise is on the ground. The people who are working with people who are homeless or who are at risk of homelessness will know people who are in that category. 
and they're the ones that need to have the discretion to be able to raise it and to pay it when they, when they can. I think there is a difficulty sometimes, whatever about the discretion is, in some of the areas, even if you look at it for single people in Cork, the, the amount that, that was uh, mentioned uh, in our submission, for a single person, uh, the only accommodation that was available costed €925 Euro versus the 485 that was there. And even with a 20% top up on that, that won't bridge the gap. So we have to look at where that is. Now, the other, the, the other point I would like to make as well is that, and this comes back to the, the point of... Just on that point, so, sorry. my experience is the CWOs have the flexibility and are delivering it. Is that not the case all over the country? No. no. Why not? Like It's the same system. Certainly, my experience. Yeah, that, that's why we have groups from different parts of the, the country here specifically for this. Well, there was a 20%, uh, there was an increase of 20% uh, in, the, in the south. It was piloted in, in, in Dublin uh, and it was moved uh, to the regions in more recent times. The difficulty is, is other things are outpacing uh, the, these moves and in some cases they're coming too late. Um, so there is a difference sometimes, and I think as well there's, there's almost a fear within the services sometimes or within the systems uh, to take the initiative and, and to do it. It's almost on a case-by-case -case basis. It needs to happen because the need is there, and the response needs to be there in terms of people um, to have the authority to be able to deal with that. That's not always the case. Generally it's supposed speaking, to be on a case-by-case -case basis. It is. Yeah, that's the way it's supposed to be. But, the, but what I'm saying is sometimes the difficulty is, is that not everybody or not all the, the situations are equal. The, the, the costs in some of the areas are beyond what people are expected or have the discretion to do at times. And those the gaps need to be dealt with. Thank you. Um, Deputy O'Sullivan. Thank you. Um, first question goes back to Bru, I'm sure. Um, and what can be done to ensure that what happened there won't happen somewhere else? Because, we, I mean, I know there are other hostels that are due to close, and the stress and anxiety for the people who are in those hostels, it's causing them even additional stress and anxiety. So how can that be prevented? I mean, they're called cold weather initiatives, but with the, the weather in this country, we could have hot weather in the winter and cold weather in the summer. It just doesn't make sense. And as long as there are people who need beds, I just don't understand why, and I accept what you said, why that sort of accommodation is being closed. Um, so I'm just asking your opinion on that, and that Fiona. I think there's enormous pressure on the staff who are working in all of these areas, and I'm in touch with Park A Street several times a day, nearly. Um, so I'm asking, they, they obviously need more staff, um, if somebody could answer that for me. <clears throat> and when you're working with people who have other needs, I don't think the resources are there. We don't have enough social workers and we don't have enough staff to support them. And I'm asking particularly in relation to those who are homeless and who are presenting with both mental health issues and addiction issues. And and former prisoners who are coming out and if they end up homeless again the whole you know cycle and circle is just going to continue um, one specific question hotels and um, is there much movement out of hotels if you had uh, figures on that um, foreign national people who present for homelessness um, there were concerns that they were being diverted to social protection so therefore we weren't getting accurate figures on the actual number who are homeless, and I'm wondering if that has been addressed. Um, and finally, just just interested to know your own chain of command. Um, who are you directly accountable to? Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Deputy O'Sullivan. Um, there were some specific questions. Fiona, I think if you'd like to start, and I, I just reflect on the comment you made, wet weather, if it, uh, cold weather, if it was wet weather, it would be open 24-7, 365 days. I suppose um, there's a number of questions in that. In recent years, because of the numbers of people coming into homeless services, it has been our experience that cold weather facilities have not closed. So we ourselves in Crosscare have been involved in a number of cold weather initiatives that then became emergency facilities, that then became cold weather facilities, and then, became, but uh, uh, over time then, I suppose in terms of the numbers in the system became supported temporary accommodations where we were able to work actively with people to exit home services. I am aware that uh, you're probably referring to the Johns Lane West facility also, which 
is a slightly different situation in that that again was opened as a cold weather facility, but I am aware that there is a planning application on that building, which as long as the individuals who are staying in that service, and whilst I can't talk for the organisations, well, as long as those individuals are provided with additional emergency accommodation, it's actually a really good thing that that plot of land will be used to provide housing for people who are experiencing homelessness. So again, it's a slightly different point. So I suppose my point is really in relation to the quantity of quality emergency accommodation required. I would assume that in some ways at the beginning of this cold weather initiative, there was a hope that 101 people 